These days, it seems like a lot of headlines can be a little dramatic, but unfortunately, these headlines are true. Houston is definitely sinking. And yet, a lot of people in Houston don't even know that it's happening, or where it's happening, or why it's happening. So, if you want to learn more about Houston's sinking problem, stay tuned, because in this video, we're digging into how it started, where it's hitting the hardest, and most importantly, what can be done about it. So, out of all the major U.S. cities, Houston is unfortunately sinking the fastest. And as geologists, we can help explain why Houston's geology makes it vulnerable to sinking, but unfortunately there are other factors that are causing Houston to sink faster than other cities with similar geology. But before we get into the science, let's pinpoint the moment that Houston began to have a sinking suspicion that it had issues with its land elevation. This photo is from 1926, and it shows four men standing around what appears to be some sunken ground at the Goose Creek oil field, which is about 45 minutes east of downtown Houston. As the name suggests, this area was heavily drilled for oil for about 10 years before this picture was taken, and with any booming industry, you're going to have a lot of people move into that area for work, which meant that, in this case, a lot of groundwater had to be pumped to serve the water needs for all the people that had moved there. They didn't know it at the time, but the sunken ground here was a result of the combination of pumping oil and water, and in total this area sank three feet over those ten years. So this was Houston's first wake-up call, and it led to decades of research into what was causing the land subsidence. Subsidence is a term that geologists use to describe the gradual sinking or settling of the Earth's surface. And in a city like Houston, it's more than just lower ground. Land subsidence can break roads, and it's partly the reason why homes in Houston have a lot of foundation issues. Hobby Airport for a while had to routinely fix cracks in their runways because of this. And the state of Texas had to pay a lot of money to fix the San Jacinto Monument's reflecting pool. It apparently sank three feet on one end and six feet on the other. It often feels like this issue is particularly bad in the Houston area, and many people will say, oh, that's due to the city being built on shrinkswell clays. But other cities are also built on shrinkswell clays, so there has to be another explanation for why we're seeing so much structural damage here and not so much in other cities. As far as who's at fault for this structural damage, well, it's Houston's fault. Or rather, it's Houston's 300 known faults. I say known because as technology improves, more faults are being discovered in the Houston area. And this is a map by geoscience researchers at the University of Houston that shows the major fault systems in the area. The faults here generally run southwest to northeast, and there's specifically a type of fault called growth faults. These faults are old faults, and they were supposed to be dormant generally, meaning the land wasn't supposed to be moving along it. However, they have recently been reactivated due to land subsidence, and if there happens to be a home or building or road sitting on top of one, serious structural damage can happen. So right behind me, you can pretty clearly see the ground um, that has subsided that way relative to me. Um, we're actually on top of a fault here in the Spring Branch area. And that fault um, is an old fault, so it was active during the Pleistocene, but it has been reactivated um, due to a few factors. And this fault, luckily there was no house, as far as I can see, directly on the fault. Actually, the guy is just mowing his lawn right over the fault. But luckily there was no house on top of the fault, so it doesn't seem like any major damage was done. But this is a good way that we can see the subsidence in action here in Houston. So after conducting a bunch of surveys, geologists found that the Spring Branch area had dropped around four feet since 1975. And in general, the land here is sliding along those ancient fault lines as it descends. So the next question is, what was triggering the land to sink along those fault lines in the first place? So in the 1940s and the 1950s, 
those land surveys scientifically confirmed the subsidence that everyone was noticing. But it wasn't until the 1960s that researchers started connecting the dots, and what they found was that in the Houston area, land subsidence was strongly correlated with groundwater pumping, meaning that the areas that pump the most groundwater were in fact sinking at higher rates. And areas like the Goose Creek oil field may have been primarily sinking due to removing oil from under that area, but for the most part, Houston was sinking because it was getting all its water supply from groundwater. Clay actually does play a role in all of this. So within the Evangeline Chico Aquifer, which is where Houston gets its groundwater from, there are clay lenses mixed within the sand, silt, and gravel. These layers of sediment are actually ancient river deposits, and they've been built up over five million years. And as water seeps into the ground today, it trickles down and saturates those layers with water. And as that groundwater gets pumped back out, it causes the water level to fall below these clay layers. And when water gets squeezed out of these clay layers, those layers compress. And this is what's causing the land above it to drop. The San Joaquin Valley in California has similar geology to Houston. And to no surprise, it also has major subsidence issues. In that valley, the aquifer is pumped to provide water for all the crops that are being grown in the valley. And there's this famous photo showing how much the land has dropped. And Houston has its very own photo just like it. The common factor between Houston's aquifer and the aquifer used to serve the needs of the San Joaquin Valley is that both aquifers are made up of unconsolidated sand, silt, gravel, and clay material. One thing to take away from this is that a lot of major U.S. cities and water-intensive industries sit on top of these types of aquifers, and that's because they're known to provide a ton of groundwater. There's just a lot of space for water to seep into, and this provides a huge water resource for growing populations and industries. But it's truly a double-edged sword because of the subsidence that comes from pumping too much water from aquifers that have clay lenses. In response to all the subsidence, the Texas legislature actually created the Harris-Galveston Subsidence District in 1975. And this type of organization was truly the first of its kind in the U.S. And their mission was, and still is, pretty simple, and that's to stop the sinking by regulating how much groundwater gets pumped. And it's been hugely successful. Areas like Baytown that once were sinking rapidly have now stabilized. And this is all due to those areas shifting their water supply from groundwater to surface water. And now Houston mainly gets its water from Lake Conroe and Lake Houston. Unfortunately, the bad news is that nearly half of Greater Houston is still sinking, some areas by over half an inch per year. And the worst hit areas are actually the fastest growing suburbs like Katy, Spring, and the Woodlands. All these areas in red there are places that are still relying heavily on groundwater. The areas in green, however, are areas that now rely on surface water as their main water supply, and they have mostly stopped sinking. So what happens whenever you let land subside too much? So right now I'm at the Baytown Nature Center. So this is basically a 400 acre plot of land that has been converted into um, natural wildlands essentially, but you can still fish and stuff here. But right now I'm on Bayshore Drive. So this is the old road that went through the Brownwood subdivision. And on either side of this road were just houses lined up along this road. And here's like the old driveway that existed. This area used to be a subdivision called the Brownwood subdivision. And it was actually a highly desirable neighborhood to live in because you have, you know, waterfront access. You have the San Jacinto Monument in the background. I don't know if you can see it right there. But yeah, all main selling points whenever you're looking for a house. But what the residents didn't realize was that this area, um, as well as all the oil and gas industries around it, were pumping a ton of water. So they were pumping so much water that the area was sinking at a rapid rate. So because of all that groundwater pumping, primarily people 
started noticing that their houses would flood all the time every time it would rain a lot and eventually after Hurricane Carla hit this area in the 80s the city said you know enough is enough where this is a threat to lives and it's also causing a lot of damage to property in this area so we're just gonna buy out all of these properties and um, turn the area into a nature center which is what they've done they even have this sign that talks about the homes here so apparently there was over 360 homes by the early 1970s and a lot of the residents here enjoyed just being in a beautiful area and fishing and sailing and probably looking at the San Jacinto Monument in the background over there. Um, they even talk about the flooding and the hurricanes that hit this area and then how they redeveloped it into a nature center. This whole area that's now completely underwater was not underwater during the 70s. But yeah, as you can see, it sank um, a total of 10 feet from what the sign said. So this area sank 10 feet and, you know, it was basically just waiting for a big storm event to fill up. And then that's what you have here. Subsidence naturally makes an area more vulnerable to flooding because it's basically making that area turn into a bowl for water to flow into. And on top of this is the added cost of having to fix all the structural damages that subsidence does to roads, homes, and buildings. So for all these reasons, Houston is lucky to have an organization like the Harris-Galveston Subsidence District that is basically doing everything to mitigate the damage caused by pumping too much groundwater. And luckily, there is hope for the areas that are sinking the most. A $1.2 billion pipeline project will hopefully bring surface water from Lake Houston to areas like Katy, and this is expected to be operational by 2026. So, unfortunately, Houston is the fastest sinking city in the U.S., but it doesn't have to be. By regulating groundwater use and investing in smart water infrastructure, we can slow and even stop subsidence in many areas. And the key is keeping aquifer levels high enough to avoid triggering further sinking, especially along those old fault lines. And for developers, planners, and residents that are in the fastest sinking regions, it's important to conserve water wherever possible. The harris galveston Subsidence District has a lot of water conservation programs for this very reason. So, thanks for being curious about this geologic hazard. The more we understand, the better we can protect the city that we call home.